and we're live. Good morning, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International European Affairs in Dublin. A very warm welcome to those of you who've braved the elements to be with us here in person in full Technicolor, and hello to everybody who is in the process of joining us online. Um, we're here for von der Leyen's new team, What Next for Europe. Um, I'm going to just mention two or three little bits of housekeeping before handing over to our, uh, mm -hmm. to our esteemed chair and panel. First of all, is to acknowledge our colleagues in the European Commission representation here in Dublin. Thank you very much for sponsoring this event alongside our colleagues at the European Parliament Liaison Office. Very pleased to be doing uh, this in, important event, which feels like the culmination of all of the exciting couple of weeks and months for those of us who, who watch Europe. Uh, our chair today is Eileen Dunn, former RT newsreader and international president of the Association of European Journalists, and indeed the people's choice for last year's Dancing with the Stars. Um, Eileen is going to introduce our panel in a moment, but just again, as ever, Eileen, thanks a million for, for being with us and for taking the time. Really looking forward to your, your stewardship. Um, just also to draw attention to two things that we have. This is one of the first follow along events I can remember because the Institute did publish a very useful publication at the start of the summer uh, on an overview of the proposed College of Commissioners, which was overseen and pulled together by Dylan Marshall, one of our researchers here. And it'll provide a useful infographic for those who want to follow the discussions today. And just the final word for me before handing over to Eileen is just to uh, acknowledge our, our colleague and friend, Barbara Nolan. I believe, Barbara, this is going to be our last collaboration together, at least in this association or this format. So just you've been a great friend to the Institute over the years, and it's been really lovely to work with you. I just want to wish you the very best with what, all the excitement that's to come once you leave your current post. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Eileen. I think, first of all, we're going to see if President Metzola comes to the stage. If she does, we might listen to her cupola fuckle. And then in due course, President von der Leyen will, will take the stage. But it's in your capable hands, Eileen. Thanks a million. Thank you. <clears throat> Day war massa, Good morning, everybody. And welcome to those of you who are here in person and, of course, to those online. As Barry says, we're gathered at the Institute for President von der Leyen's address to the European Parliament, where she's going to present her new team of commissioners. And as he says, this event is being co-hosted with the European Commission and European Parliament representation in Ireland. So if you're joining us online today, you'll be able to join the discussion with the Q&A function on Zoom. Please feel free to send your questions throughout as they occur to you, and we'll come to them after some initial discussion with the panel. And if you're in the room, you'll be able to ask your questions by raising your hand in the second half of the discussion. Uh, today's Q&A and the presentations will all be on the record unless stated otherwise. And we would ask you to identify yourselves and declare your affiliations as you ask your questions. To briefly introduce my panel, I see uh, the European Parliament President is on her feet. We might listen in to her in a moment. But on my left, I have John O'Brennan, who's Professor of European Politics at Maynooth University, Catherine Day, former Secretary General of the European Commission, and Dan O'Brien, Chief Economist at the IIEA. So following the President's speech, the panel will discuss what she's saying and the implications. And in fact, I see she's on her feet already. Okay, well, that concludes the presentation of the new College of Commissioners from Strasbourg. Your thoughts, panel? John, first. I thought it was a pretty tepid speech, and it got a pretty tepid response from the Parliament. I mean, at times it was quite embarrassing, I thought. Uh, I don't think it was a reflection on individual commissioners, but um, it it wasn't the kind of speech that we normally see in a State of the Union speech. Now, there were interesting things in there, interesting announcements. Uh, for example, this investment commission, the um, competitiveness compass, both of which I think come out of the Draghi report and the strategic dialogue on uh, defense and security. So it wasn't without content. content and. I think she was kind of charting an intention to do lots of different things in 100 days. It was interesting that she didn't mention Donald Trump once, literally the elephant in every room, didn't say much about the threats to EU security. Instead, she framed it as being largely about competitiveness in the way that Draghi did. And she said nothing about how we might finance the 
hugely ambitious things that Draghi points to, 888 billion euros year after year after year necessary to place Europe in a better position. So if we were looking for something like the um, landscape that prefigured the single European act in 1980. 86, 87. I don't think we got it there. It isn't to say that it won't happen, but the politics of um, national jurisdictions, I think, points against even the least ambitious kind of embrace of Draghi. And I think what she was trying to do was kind of cajole the European institutions into taking Draghi seriously and doing what she could to advance at least some of the more practical things as part of the Commission's immediate new mandate. Okay, I'll come back to you on a couple of those points. Catherine, what did you think, and how did it compare to five years ago? I'd have a different take on it. It wasn't the State of the Union speech. This is to get the vote in the Commission through. For me, it was quite a confident um, performance of a, of a Commission president who is totally in charge. Um, she is a second-term president. She knows the ropes. Um, I think there were a lot of subtle messages there that I was picking up. So I agree with John that competitiveness, defence, investment commission, reducing the regulatory burden. Um, but there were hints like uh, the, the money is too scattered. You're going to see much more concentrated um, spending of a bigger budget, uh, smart conditionality, which member states will hate, but which is absolutely necessary if you ask for a bigger budget. You must be able to show the added value of the spending. Um, I, I thought it wasn't... Uh, the fact that she decided to name check every commissioner wasn't good. It was too long. But that shows you the difficulty she has in running a commission of 26, where she didn't nominate anybody. Um, and through all the toings and froings that we've all witnessed, every member state has got its nominee through. Now, they mightn't like who the other member states have nominated, but they all got their man or woman through. Uh, and that in itself was not easy to do. So I think um, you can see somebody who has structured the commission to suit her view of the world. She wants them to work across uh, topics. Some will do that better than others. Um, I thought it was very interesting that she started by saying that Europe is an eternal struggle, and it is. And this is one one obvious truism I want to say here, but which people forget all the time. The Commission and the Parliament work Europe-wide. That's what they're supposed to do. But the member states are intensely national, and that's what their electorates want them to do. It's only in a crisis, and the crisis has to affect almost all member states before member states will look for a European solution. And heaven knows there are so many crises pre-programmed in where we are now that I am more optimistic than maybe most because I think Europe would have to respond to a crisis, but it has to, it would probably have to get worse before the germs of these ideas will actually form the basis of where we go next. Um, one last thing I'd like to say is that I think um, as a confident second term president with working now with um, uh, the president of the European Council, Costa, and with Kaya Callas. I think that's a very strong team, which will be able to work much better together than previous combinations that we've seen. And that, for me, will also be a very important key to um, the future, which will be very bumpy. Europe is a little slow, too expensive, but it's good in a crisis. And I'm, I'm afraid it will be tested many times in the next five years. Again, I'll come back to you on, on some of those points, but Dan, your initial impressions. Good. I, I thought it was good. Uh, let me start with a, a criticism uh, of something she said. War is raging at Europe's borders. Um, the troops of an East Asian dictatorship are fighting Europeans on European soil. Uh, I don't think she actually went far enough uh, to say that the wars on our borders is actually within uh, wider on, 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 our, on our continent. Um, <clears throat> but I think she, she framed it well, and I'm going to focus on the economics, but it's impossible to deal with economics these days without looking at the economic security, the geoeconomics, geopolitics of it. So I, I was impressed by the opening where she, she mentioned um, freedom doesn't come for free. Um, every weakness is weaponized. So the world has fundamentally changed over the past five years in terms of uh, economic security. You know, it used to be about competitiveness and investment. Now we have to think of 
all of our economic policy making in the context of security and a changed environment in which we live, that we need to make sure that we are not vulnerable uh, as we are in many ways. And I think the, the, the focus was much more on that strategic vulnerabilities and, and our security, um, something probably that we in Ireland don't feel because of our geography and being so far away, but certainly speaking to people closer to further east, it, it becomes more and more important uh, for them. So just on, on the particular the things she mentioned, uh, scaling up of businesses. This is our real weakness in Europe. So we are just not getting these companies that are growing uh, growing rapidly. There's a lot of economic evidence to say that the most the companies that add productivity, that drive productivity, which is what makes us more prosperous, are those small, medium-sized startup companies. They're the ones that really produce the innovation. And we've been weak. Draghi pointed that out, highlighted that, the need to scale up. She mentioned that uh, as being really important. Uh, she mentioned the regulatory burden. Uh, she mentioned the car industry, which she will share her chair herself. It's a hugely important uh, industry for Europe, and, and it is uh, uh, threatened given the speed of, of Chinese electric vehicle um, improvement. Uh, she mentioned a clean industrial deal within 100 days. Um, so overall, I thought it, it touched on, on a lot of you know, the, the, the right things and put it in a context of an utterly changed security environment. So, <clears throat> change security environment, from, but also change, change the environment within the parliament itself and, and within the commission. Do you think that influenced her speech that she, she was afraid of offending me? Um, well, she, she has a majority of EPP people. So, in some senses, nothing has changed very much. But we have the first representative of the far right that we, I think, think ever had in the commission. Uh, look at what happened in Romania at the weekend, the latest reminder of the strength of the far right, where a candidate who was barely mentioned in dispatches comes first in the first round of uh, their election. We we'll know more after the parliamentary elections at the weekend in Romania, but it was just the latest signal of this move to the right. Uh, you, uh, you can, can see, see it very right clearly on issues like, like migration. migration. So well, she, has she has a delicate, delicate kind of balance. Of the EPP was depending on some of those right-wing members to get their candidate. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, the politics of it was kind of ugly, but in some ways it was actually easier than it was last time around and in 2014. Um, I don't anticipate that there will be a rejection of the commission in the vote today. There's no indication that's going to happen. Uh, and that will probably help her mandate and her legitimacy as well. It's probably stronger than it was last time around. Catherine, she had a subtle dig at the number of women commissioners. She said she got 11 through, but it was up from five of the original nominees. That's something she's still very strong on. Yes, it's it's very disappointing in a way that we actually think we're we have come further in the normalization of having women at the top table than is the reality. Um, and I think, I mean, President Barroso had to struggle to get one third women. President Juncker had to threaten to resign in order to get one third women. Um, how much longer does it take? So, and she clearly uh, puts a great emphasis on it. I think she has some very strong women in her team. Um, and so I think yet again, um, the, the normality of having women around the table and you do need critical mass. And I have seen it directly. The, the kind of discussion the commission has is very different when you have a critical mass of women around the table. So I think it would be good for policy making, And it's also good for the visibility of Europe at a time when even in the United States there's a kind of a kickback uh, so I think she, she is passionately committed to that and she will continue to, to fight for it. Um, but I think there, there are a lot of things that Ireland will have to think about. Um, treaty change, I think a shudder went through yes, almost yeah. everybody listening. Um, and defence. But defence, um, there's no denying that Europe has to step up to its own defence. And um, Ireland will have to decide where it positions itself. We are not a player. So we could probably get all kinds of opt-outs. Is that the kind of role we want to have in the future of Europe? I think a, a debate that we have dodged for a long time is coming. Um, I do worry a bit about competition policy in that, um, yes, scaling up is fine. That will mean um, on the merger side, 
agreeing more mergers, but on the state aid side, um, if that reflects a loosening, that will lead to the kind of competition that we have fought against for so long. Um, and I, I do also worry about just um, how overall, uh, how open will Europe stay when faced with protectionism in our main comp competitors? I hope that our reflex will, in Europe will not be to kind of close down the borders as well from a business point of view, but we will have to fight against that and that's a vital interest for, for Europe. Um, so I think there, there's a lot of food for thought there for the incoming government here. Um, and again, we will have to, even the bigger budget will be uh, a challenge here, but uh, because we are now a net, net contributor. Mm. But my, my bottom line about saying that it takes a big crisis, um, my bottom line is that every single current member state understands at a very deep level that its own country for its prosperity and security needs the EU to succeed. So no matter how fractious it will be and how difficult it will be, I think this is also a time when maybe Europe has to take more control of its own destiny, live up more to its own values, maybe stop preaching about it and actually do it. So um, I come from uh, a school of eternal optimism and <laughs> Barroso used to say to us, you have a duty of optimism. And so I, I, ca I carry that duty of optimism still. So I see many positives that come out of this, but it will be a rocky road and it will be very difficult. But Europe has this capacity to reinvent itself all the time. And I'm, I'm would be very interested to see what the next incarnation looks like. Well, she talked a lot about the, the first 100 days and yeah. the amount of yeah. stuff. I know Tony Blair in his book says, if you don't get it done in the mm -hmm. first 100 days, it's not going to get done because events start catching yeah. up with you yeah. and you lose the momentum. Dan, there'll be an awful lot happening in the next 100 days. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, th there will. Um, and again, that just from an Irish perspective, you know, this issue, for example, state aids and competition, you know, this suited a small country like Ireland for decades. We, we now have a harder choice. You know, do we want a French based European champion or a Chinese company that dominates a particular market in Europe? We, we, we're, we're facing choices now and they are not optimal from an Irish perspective and changes to state aids and competition policy um, were pretty much optimal for small countries. I think we're facing the choice of them being suboptimal for smaller countries, but being the best option at a European level. And that's going to be a tough one. Certainly the, the uh, referendum alert um, caught, caught my eye. That's another mm -hmm. thing. Um, you know, in some ways, this the thing around the defense industry, you know, Europe is rearming. You know, we, we still have as part of our foreign policy disarmament as a, as a, you know, disarmament is fantastic. As an economist, spending money on weapons and soldiers is, is such a waste when there are so many positive things you could spend on. But that is the reality. You know, she mentioned Russia, 9% of GDP spent on, on defense. You know, we can't fight against, you know, a jumped up petrol state. We can't protect ourselves against that. That's absurd. You know, we spend more on social protection, twice as much on social protection in Europe than Russia generates in annual GDP, yet Russia is militarily more powerful. Like that's the reality we're living in. And, you know, we're either going to have to be part of Europe on this or, you know, seek all sorts of opt-outs, which, you know, I don't think is going to be in our national interests. And after the solidarity we've got over Brexit uh, is going to look very, very strange to our partners. So and John, hard if you think about ahead. it, even looking at that debate last night, that hasn't featured in our in our election run in no. at all, defence. Uh, no, but actually I had um, lunch with two ambassadors a couple of weeks ago and they said to me, John, you're so fortunate to live in a boring country. Yeah. Uh, I got what they were saying, um, uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, Europe is just not part of our cognitive day-to-day uh, being. And I keep saying that this is a threat. Uh, the complacency of our political class on Europe is astonishing. We lost two referendums in 01 and 08, and they learned none of the lessons. Last year, you know how much uh, government spent on communicating Europe? 345,000 euros just slightly bigger than that fucking bike shed in Leinster House cars. So is that an indication of people who are serious about Europe? 
Uh, we have virtually no support in the universities for teaching Europe any longer. Uh, if we need funding, we have to go to Brussels to get it. There's no other option domestically. Uh, so just, and, and I guess it's a reflection of the fact that we do crises relatively well, but longer term strategic planning is completely neglected. And Europe is just one example of this. So you see, I was making the point, I, I did a session with some students last week that it had become more relevant and that they're more engaged because of Brexit. But in general, we don't seem to have learned. No, I don't think we've learned any of those lessons at all. And when von der Leyen mentioned treaty change. She didn't link it to any specific institutional change or any, anything else. But that's the point where we have to sell Europe to a public. It's a bit like cramming for an exam when you've completely failed to do any reading in the course of the university term. Um, it's very difficult to do. And we rely on TDs and senators and councillors to some extent to sell Europe when they have no interest in or engagement with Europe for most of their time in the Oireachtas or whatever other level. Yes, in the yearly surveys that come out, Irish people see the value of Europe. Mm. I was going to pick that up because, um, I mean, generally, I think we don't spend enough time thinking about Europe and we don't spend enough time thinking about our role. When we do, we try to inflate it. We could be the leader in whatever. No, we must learn to work with other countries earlier if we want to have an influence. But I do think, I mean, it was interesting in the European elections this time around that there was more discussion about which European parties our new MEPs would be joining. That's the first time I've ever heard that. And it shows an awareness that something is happening out there, which, you know, which we can be part of, but isn't part of the traditional way that we look at Europe. Um, and I, I, I do think that we need to start a real ongoing discussion about what kind of Europe we want. Um, because so many of the things that are coming down the track will not necessarily be what we instinctively want. So we will have to think about, OK, we mightn't like it, but how would we deal with it? Um, who else would be more of like minded with us? Um, and and to st in a way to engage for the first time since we joined um, in the kind of um, working in between member states and institutions that the others have done for generations. So the, the way to do it is there. We have all the ability, but we we haven't been driven by the need yet. And I think that that pressure is coming now. And it, it, we are more than capable of dealing with it, but we just have to take it seriously. Just to come back to the new commission itself, I heard you and John talking earlier about there are some new portfolios in there. There's a split up of portfolios. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's going to affect the workings of this commission? I think it will depend a lot on the attitude of the individual commissioners. They can make it work. Um, it's not like a national government when you're in cabinet and your party has won certain number of seats um, and you've had years looking at the manifesto and what you want to do. These are people who didn't know each other brought together. Some, some are continuing commissioners, but most are coming from outside. Um, and they have a very strong president who is not excessively collegial, I would say, and who knows what she's doing and what she wants. And that was a clear indication of what she wants. So they can choose either to, to work with that agenda and to make what they're doing relevant. And every single bit of every portfolio is relevant to some part of Europe. Um, or they can uh, say, oh, you know, I didn't get what I want and I would have preferred something else and I don't have enough troops and all the rest of it. The commission is well used to working with uh, very different commissioners, very different groupings. So I think if they are committed to working together, and to making it this model succeed, then it will. But I think if if they don't make that commitment now, very early on, then some of them will simply get left to the side because it's clear where the train is going. So you either choose to be on it and make the best of your contribution, or you can wave it goodbye and be miserable for five years. Okay, just before we open up to the audience, both here and at home, I'm going to ask each of you, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing her and her commission? Well, I think competitiveness and industrial policy jump out very obviously. Look what Trump did the day before yesterday, slapping 25% tariffs, he's saying, on 
Mexico and on Canada and China, that's going to be a really big issue. And anybody who says, well, we got through four years of Trump, his bark is much worse than his bite. This is a much more radical administration committed to doing much more America first stuff. And as Catherine said, this is a real challenge, I think, to the integrity of the single market model. And as Dan said, this is a model that's worked really well for Ireland. I think we're in an increasingly uncomfortable position uh, because we cannot compete at scale if you've got subsidies for whatever industry you might like to name. So I think that's going to be the major challenge. The other one is defense and security. And um, here the threat is that Trump will take the United States if not out of NATO, that he will make Article 5 inoperable. Now, that means that the European countries, for the first time since 1949, are going to have to put their own security arrangements in place. Now, there's been lots of thought, I think, that's gone into this over the last year as it became more um, likely that Trump would return. But they're going to have to put flesh on the bones of this, including the defense industrial policy that von der Leyen talked about. I think we've got a very good commissioner or set of commissioners, if you include the defense and security commissioner for the very first time, along with the HRVP. Um, that's a really good, strong team, I think, as Catherine has said. But the world will change existentially if Trump decides to do what he has told von der Leyen and others that he would do in the past. And we are going to have to think very carefully about security and defense and about financing it at European level. And I think within the last few weeks, although she didn't mention it, um, there's some suggestion that tens of billions, Catherine might correct me on this, left over from parts of the budget and next generation EU, which have been unspent, are going to be redirected to give uh, Commissioner Kaboulis the start that he needs. But we're a long, long way from anything like a kind of centralized European Commission managed defense and security framework. Catherine. I think in addition to what John has said, migration, because that's something that is that people are concerned about. So handling that way, we have to have a conversation about why Europe needs migration, why it's part of our prosperity and how we have to handle it well. And she talked about fair and firm. Um, I think also dealing with the insidious um, interference by Russia is actually a huge challenge because the amount of disinformation, the amount of, like we just mentioned, the Romanian elections, that's largely Russian inspired. I think trying to um, hold on to the way that democracy works and not have it undermined by uh, state actors from outside uh, and the, the influence, the insidious influence that it has inside, I think that's another big challenge and, and very difficult to address. And Dan? Um, yeah, I just think it's important to say that the President of the Commission, just like the President of the United States, doesn't have a steering wheel or an accelerator on his or her desk mm -hmm. that can drive the European economy. It's a much more slow burn issue. Uh, John pretty much said what, what I want to say, so I'll say it pretty quickly, that what Trump is currently proposing, with nothing has been seen like this since the Smoot-Hawley Act almost 100 years ago. The scale of what he's proposing is simply off the charts. Uh, von der Leyen herself has said that this could cut transatlantic trade by 40%. Now, 40% will push Europe into recession, and you know many countries are already in recession. And the second thing, again, if there's a question over Article 5 and, and some sort of deal is imposed on Russia, um, <clears throat> security situation in Europe will be absolutely transformed. Again, <clears throat> I don't think that's appreciated. Uh, here in Europe, I saw a security correspondent recently say that if if, our, if, if NATO collapsed, uh, it wouldn't have much effect in Ireland because we're not uh, in NATO. That is just absurd. NATO is the absolute centre of European security, has been for 75 years. Um, we could have a major security crisis. So, you know, the, all of European leaders could be dealing with a transatlantic trade war, which Ursula von der Leyen will lead in terms of retaliation that's already being done, uh, and then a massive security crisis on top of that. Okay. Now I'm going to open up. <laughs> I'm going to open up to the floor and to our Zoom. So let, let's take someone from in, in house first. I see you with your hand up. As I say, please um, identify yourself and declare affiliations, please. 
Hi, um, Paddy Smith, um, Irish Times. Uh, I, I'm, I agree completely with what has been said from the platform about the challenges facing uh, the European Union. But perhaps I was most struck by the um, uh, her response to the these incipient challenges is really just to say we'll, we'll we'll march forward in this direction rather than to say how she proposes to bridge the gap um in terms of of, of the member states i'm talking about draghi uh, the the idea of treaty change the idea you know the the colossal challenge of mff uh the colossal challenge of building a, a defense uh union um all of which require an EU that is qualitatively different uh, from that which at the moment uh, exists. I think this is understood in the um, Commission. I think it's understood in the in the Parliament. But I think, that, and this has struck me most, that there's a huge gulf with the member states, that there's no evidence yet at all that the member states prepared to embrace the 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 uh, these particular structural fundamental issues and and i would I just wondered how people see that well one thing is the weakness of the franco-german relationship which is partly about the domestic weakening of macron's authority after the election i'm sure you've seen today michel barnier is saying if we lose this vote on the budget the government is going to fall france is in a really perilous position with a six percent budget deficit, the cuts and the tax rises, 60, 70 billion euros are very, very difficult. And precisely at the same moment, the government in Berlin is collapsing and we have a federal election coming up. Uh, so I can't remember a time when that Franco-German motor of integration, there were always periods of challenge and stress and everything, but it is weaker than I can ever remember, precisely at the point where we need strong leadership from Berlin and Paris. And that it, it's difficult to say how that's going to work out over the next year, but it can't be unimportant relative to the kind of challenges that may be thrown up after the 20th of January. Um, well, the reason I made my truth, my truism statement about the member states think national, and we shouldn't be surprised about that, is that it's always been like that. Um, and I think that um, it is the job of the institutions that have the wider mandate to come with ideas. And I do think uh, the way that the president of the commission and the president of the European Council, president of the parliament and the high representative work together will be hugely important because if they can look at strategies and bring them to the table, then the member states can't shoot against one institution. They can't say, oh, the stupid commission hasn't understood anything. Oh, the parliament is way out there. Uh, and I, I really think that, that that foursome is going to have to do a lot of heavy lifting. Anything they put on the table will be rubbished and picked apart, but it will have the germs of something that can be agreed. And it, unfortunately, it will be slow, it will take time. That's why I think several of her 100 day blueprints will be very important to start engaging the member states on looking at these issues. They don't want to, they won't want to increase the MFF. It's just over 1% of EU GDP at the moment. It's absolutely laughable. It will have to go to three or five. They will all die of shock, but gradually they will get there. And the other thing I think is we, we in Ireland haven't taken into account the fact that the EU is um, much less West European than it used to be, than the one that we joined. It's getting much more, I wouldn't say it's going east, but the eastern dimension is coming to the fore for some of the wrong reasons, like with the wars, etc. But also you have a Polish budget commissioner, you have a Lithuanian defense commissioner. This is remaking of a different kind of Europe that we are not perceiving as much as is actually happening. So. I think the, but the member states will always be slow because they are 99% focused on the domestic. And even France and Germany have always, when they want to think of a European design, it's a greater German design or a greater French design. Whereas all of us little guys have to come in and make sure it's, we've got a part of the design as well for it to work. So, so there's that shift, but Dan, there's also, for the first time, a Mediterranean commissioner. Yeah. 
as an astronaut. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what can I say? I worked for the European Commission in Malta in the Mediterranean, and it was always uh, talked about as the soft underbelly of, of Europe. And I think that's very much come home. Uh, you know, back in when, when, I, when I worked there, there was almost no migration, and clearly now it's become a, a, a major issue. So probably appropriate. Okay. Um, and, and anyone else here in the room before I go to? Um, yeah, Barbara. Barbara Nolan, European Commission. Um, there was quite an emphasis on making things easier for business and simplification. I mean, was that a sort of admission that uh, there has been over-regulation over the past years? I mean, Catherine will know what I'm talking about because she was a pioneer of the better regulation uh, and we seem to be coming back again uh, to that. So, I mean, are we over-regulated um, uh, what, you know, I mean, every time you come to simplification, I mean, there's a reason why certain things exist and it's, it's a very hard exercise actually. So I'd just like to hear the panel's thoughts on that. And overlap, talk of overlap too in, in application processes and, uh, and that, that regulation slowing down and, and holding us back in terms of competitiveness. What do you think? Maybe I'll start on that yeah. since I lived through a lot of it. Um, I, I don't think we're over-regulated in terms of Europeans want to have protections against certain things, but I think we have over-regulated the detail. And that's partly because the institutions don't trust the member states to implement uh, what they sign up to, and for good reason, sometimes. Um, so I think we need, but, but we're making less and less new legislation. What we have now is a large body of existing legislation which we're afraid to go back and update. And the second thing I think that is needed is, uh, it isn't only at European level. Loads of detail gets added in at national level. And it should be the case that when you decide something at 27, especially if it's a regulation and not a directive, then the member states should take out what they have, but they don't, they add it on top. So there's as much work to be done in the member states as at the EU level. But I do think also, because we have so many coalitions of interest in the Parliament, in the Commission, in the Member States, it is more difficult because everybody has to put some mark into whatever is coming through. And I mean, just looking from the point of view now of being on some boards at the um, sustainability reporting that's coming down the track, it is hugely expensive. Nobody really even understands it. Everybody knows they have to do it. That's a bad place to be. And we should be able to achieve the objectives more easily in a way that you can actually explain to people. So it's not about diluting the ambition, but it's certainly about cleaning out a lot of the detail. And, and systems cling to their regulations because they know them, even if they're difficult. I know we, we tried to simplify. We made loads of proposals. And member states says, yeah, yeah, I know you're right, but, but you know, it'll be so difficult to change. So that has to change. Mm -hmm. It's a really complex question as we live in a more, a more and more complex world, how to regulate markets that very few people understand that are extremely detailed. Uh, so on, on one hand, the REACH directive, which uh, regulation uh, for chemicals uh, was broadly welcomed by the, like there was pushback, but then for example- Now it's working and, and welcome. And, and welcome and, and British, when they left, the British chemical industry wanted to stick with it because it gave them some certainty. So regulation can be good. It can also be overly burdensome, you know, for small com companies in particular, they have to fill in all these forms. This is really, really difficult for smaller companies. So uh, there needs to be a sort of focus on more possible leeway for smaller companies that just won't get that start, won't get that um, the, the capacity to scale up if they have to spend so much time on form filling and complying with regulation and all sorts of compliance. It'd be very interesting to see, again, what happens in the United States. There is a massive deregulatory plan. Mm -hmm. uh, now, maybe that'll work. And if it is, we are going to have to re re respond to that. Uh, but maybe it'll just lead to chaos and it won't be successful, but it'll certainly be a very interesting experiment in whether massive deregulation dereg actually lifts economic growth significantly or just creates chaos. And Europeans might come to appreciate regulation when they see these lunatics uh, in the United States, uh, doing the kind of things that Trump is saying he is absolutely going to do. Um, 
I think, would be very glad of being overregulated in that kind of context. I think about the British currently and the choices that they're facing if they're doing a trade deal. Hello, chlorinated chicken and hormone infested beef, because those are the trade offs in that kind of world that they have played. Now, in. here's a question from Colin Rafter, IIEA member formerly of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Should we be disappointed that there was no mention of EU-UK relations and that there was no mention of the weakening of the multilateral system? Um, no, uh, because <laughs> they don't really matter anymore. So um, why should we obsess about it? From, even from our point of view, though. Even from our point of view. Okay, Catherine? Well, I think the fact that there's no mention of Brexit is, shows how much the EU has moved on. Yeah. Uh, it's not their problem anymore. Um, the the weakening of the multilateral system, I think, is something that could have had a mention, but then she would have had to go into a whole foreign policy area relationship, and she, she wasn't going to do that today. But I, I think Europe has to internalize what that means. Like, we, we were the world champions of the multilateral system. We like rules and regulations. We are dutiful. We're very hard to negotiate with, but once we agree something, we dutifully go home and implement it. That world is over now. And we haven't yet um, imagined what a different world would be. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if the Europeans stopped preaching so much to the outside world, um, I think quite a lot of the rest of the world would like a rules-based system. So I think there's scope for something else to come in its place. But maybe we do have to see the chaos. That's that the second come. time you've mentioned preaching. That's obviously yeah. something that... Well, I think we do too much of that. Yeah. And we have, like... What, what I, I, I would find very annoying sitting in a, a world forum on anything would be to have speeches by the EU leadership followed by 27 identical speeches from the member states. I mean, we have to grow up and realise that that's not what the world wants to see from Europe. They would like to see leadership from Europe, but it has to be expressed in a single voice and of a single policy. And, and that is politically very difficult to deal with in Europe, but it's part of what I mean about um, maybe under pressure coming to an, uh, an, the next incarnation of what the EU will be. Now, the EU may have moved on from Brexit, but the UK is trying to normalise relations to some extent. Yeah, um, not sure that's going to go very far. I spoke to somebody in London who's very knowledgeable about these things and is not particularly impressed by how the new government has started and how prepared it is. But let me say, I don't think it's in any way surprising that Ursula von der Leyen didn't mention Britain. Britain doesn't broadly matter that much from a European perspective, but I totally disagree with John in terms of how it matters for us. Brexit, I've always called it a strategic nightmare for Ireland. Britain is a massive neighbour. We are connected to it in so many ways. It was an ideal situation to have Britain locked into the European rules-based order. Now that it's outside, we have this con continuous nightmare. Just one example, in recent months, Ireland, despite its geographic position, has, some of the, has had some of the highest per capita number of asylum applications. Now, why is that? Well, government says it's because we have an open border with Britain. We're not part of the Schengen Agreement. Our free movement is with Britain. So we, we will always be affected by Britain. And Britain being out of the European Union is a sort of daily, weekly nightmare for this country and will continue to be. So we have to pay attention to Britain. It's our big neighbor. We have no choice. OK, we're almost. OK, it does matter to Europe, and that is on defense. Yeah. And particularly if going forward. Yeah. Uh, we're almost out of time. Is there anybody? OK, I just see a couple of hands very quickly, say here in the middle. Don Lovralakon, a member of the Institute. I want to ask basically Dan a question and hear the other comments as well. Uh, the President von der Leyen mentioned uh, competitiveness. And in the same speech, she said, we must protect the European car industry. And she's also promoting innovation. Well, I suggest that the big lesson we should take from innovation in the States is that it does lead to the destruction of existing businesses, not completely, but com replacing them. IBM still exists, but it's not the force it was. ATT doesn't exist, et cetera, et cetera. You can start. We don't allow that in Europe. And it ain't going to happen in the car industry, despite uh, because she says she's going to protect it. When you see that state of Lower Saxony 
has a major stake or a 20% stake in Volkswagen. So how serious can the draggy agenda be taken given that there are long practices of protecting the incumbents and not allowing Schumpeter's creative destruction? Yeah, I'd like that's more a very good statement rather than a question. I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I think you capture very nicely the the difficult choices and the trade offs. You know, I could easily see, you know, if you, if you go back, there've been far more European cars in the United States than American cars in Europe. Why? Because we had high, much higher tariffs on American cars than vice versa. I think we're probably looking at a world where we're going to have much higher tariffs on Chinese and non uh, other non European countries to protect the industry because it's so big. That may lead to a lack of innovation, slow things down. But I think in other sectors, hopefully you might think, see things uh, changing. But there's, there's always going to be this, you know, we need to boost innovation on the one hand, but we can't allow a massive industry that, that employs so many people just to collapse. Uh, and uh, there's also the security dimension of cars. You know, they call cars now pieces of software with, with manufactured pieces added on. You know, the security questions as to whether the Chinese could push a button and all the electric cars could go off. Or, you know, so it's, I, I think it's a, your, your question is a, is a, is a perfectly formed uh, difficulty that Europe, Europe has. One final one from down here. You had your hand up, yeah. Um, Noel Barden from the Irish Farmers Journal. So if I could kind of follow on from the points that were raised on simplification and over-regulation, um, I suppose for farmers and agriculture in particular, there were quite a few pieces of Green Deal legislation where kind of the Green Deal targets were actually translated into regulations in the last commission. And what we would have saw was that those that were proposed at the start of the commission or earlier in its term were far stronger than those proposed later on. Um, and there was quite a bit of opposition from Parliament at various stages, even the, the pesticides regulation didn't make it over the line. The nature restoration law was very touch and go for a while. Um, so I suppose from this new commission, is there any indications of whether or not it's going to come out strong on these aspects of environmental regulation yet, when it is talking about competition and over-regulation? Or will it take maybe the more moderate approach that it took later into its term? Or do any of you have any thoughts on that? Well, she did say we must stay the course on the European Green Deal. I think, by the way, her commitment to the European Green Deal began to weaken once the farmers arrived in Brussels in January, European Parliament elections coming up in May. And I don't think she should have given in on those things, but she was kind of restating her commitment, saying we must be more agile and announcing a clean industrial deal. Yeah. Not sure what that means. Again, within 100 days, uh, I think you, she points to Teresa Ribera. She's going to have a hugely important portfolio here. Um, and... Um, the the... I would like to think that the sort of lead that I think von der Leyen genuinely gave in 2019, that it will be maintained, but there are all kinds of national pressures, which I think are mitigating in favor of less being done at European level, certainly than is optimum. And either else of you like to comment on that before we wrap? Well, I think the EU is all about compromise. So I think again, the, the center, the I think it is right for the Commission to have a bold plan. Uh, climate change is something no individual member state can deal with, so they have to deal with it collectively. They don't like, uh, again, dealing collectively because compromise means everybody gets something, so you have to take bits you don't like. But um, I, I think uh, there may be a change in the way things are put. So, for example, I can see renewable energy investment being put under the security heading rather than the green heading. But what matters is that it happens. So I think there will be uh, maybe a rearranging of the words. But I think in the parliament, for example, there is a strong consensus that Europe has to continue to tackle climate change. So maybe how it's done will be subtly different and some of it will be relabeled. But I think she, she will keep a commitment now that she's a second term president, she doesn't have to worry about that anymore. The parliament is new, like they're all starting off again, really. So um, there will have to be compromises. But I, I would hope that they would stick the course on, on an ambitious climate change um, agenda. 
but but maybe also experience will allow them to tailor it to be realistic to be to uh, not just seek to impose it but to engage people in finding that there are more than one ways of doing it and as long as we get there that's what's important in europe overly protected farmers for decades and decades in a change security world i think maybe we're not giving enough focus to security of food supply uh, and if we reduce food supply in an effort to reduce emissions and that food production just simply goes anywhere else. It's not entirely clear to me, does that actually benefit the planet and, and, and reducing climate change? It would certainly reduce Europe, Europe's food security and that is not a good thing. Okay, well, we're over time now. There was a question here from Peter Gunning about the size of the commission and the list of commissioners and would there be a case for having a smaller commission? But that would open up a whole other can of worms, which we're not going to get to today. today. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. So I'd just like to say thank you to John, to Catherine and to Dan and to you, whether here or on Zoom, for joining us this morning. Thank you. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.